Hello and welcome to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard. And today we are speaking with Susan Anderson. She is a return guest. She did an interview a couple of years back about taming your outer child and the response it received was so amazing. It's helped so many people. So I'm thrilled that she's come out with her latest book, The Abandonment Recovery Workbook, Guidance Through the Five Stages of Healing from Abandonment, Heartbreak, and loss. And Susan Anderson is a psychotherapist, founder of the Abandonment Recovery Movement, and has 30 years experience working with victims of trauma, grief, and loss. She's the author of four trail br- trailblazing books, including The Journey from Abandonment to Healing and Taming Your Outer Child, which I just mentioned. And she also offers workshops throughout the world. And she lives in New York. You can find her at Abandonment dot net and outer child dot net and just to get the show started today i'd love to start out with an intention for today and if you're in a safe place to close your eyes feel free to do so and just focusing on our hearts and our breath breathing in feeling the sensations within our bodies and just getting present to this moment. And today I just want to set the intention that anyone who is feeling loss, heartbreak or abandonment, that they'll find this recording or this broadcast and truly feel that it's a source of healing and and connect with the supports that they need in their lives. And so it is. So thank you so much for being here today, Susan. It is such a pleasure to have you back. I'm really excited. So maybe we can just jump in and give people who are new to your work an idea of what it means to be abandoned. Well, people who um, respond to that concept of abandonment, for, it's universal, really. Everyone has abandonment wound from childhood or even birth, from the original birth trauma. Everyone ha- can connect with the fear of, of losing someone he loves or of, of having the rug pulled out from underneath them. Um, and so it's a universal um, condition. It's the it's the crux of the human condition but people who really respond to that word are people who are going through a breakup or people who have experienced earlier losses maybe in childhood and the abandonment fear that they have interferes in their current life it makes them insecure it gives them you know patterns of self they sabotage their goals that's the outer child aspect of abandonment But the root cause of outer child and the self-sabotage is the unresolved abandonment. So people who respond to the outer child, the the abandonment feeling, are people who are are either currently experiencing it because they've been fired from a job or excluded from a friendship, or they're going through a breakup or they are suffering from old wounds that prevent them from really finding a relationship or feeling comfortable within a relationship. Thank you, Susan. And I notice that I had troubles with relationships in the past and would end up in relationships with people who are emotionally unavailable or perhaps um, emotionally abusive in some way. And for many, many years, I didn't know that it was abusive because he wasn't hitting me. Yes. And it was only when I saw someone on Twitter who said, actually, I think it was um, the woman who has that show, The Millionaire Matchmaker, she tweeted that she finally realized that she had abandonment issues. And I had never really heard of that term before. But as soon as I heard her say that, I was like, that's me. How frequently do you find that other people are in that same situation where they don't really get that there's a problem, they just think that maybe they're unlucky in love? Yes, well, 
abandonment is a great organizing principle and people who've been you know reading my books over the years they've been out for about uh, 16 17 years now um, suddenly they find an organizing principle and it's like a revelation and so the, the workbook is an attempt to take the whole process of recovery from this sort of universal uh, wound that human beings do share and help guide them through the step-by-step -step process because now that they've come become aware of the fact that it's the abandonment that makes it so painful for them to go through a breakup, to go through a divorce, to be outside of a relationship and, and to, to feel like you've missed the boat, um, that it's abandonment that's in there. Once they understand that, it's an amazing revelation, but then they want to heal that wound. And so this is a book that guides them through step by step. Wonderful. Well, just to clarify, I can imagine that anyone who's going through any kind of loss could experience feelings of abandonment. But is this book designed for anyone who's going through a loss or specifically for people who have these old wounds from childhood? Anyone who's going through a loss, since we all have the uh, you know universal abandonment fear that we, we are born um, with it really because we are born from an, a, a warm place inside of our mothers and then we're th thrust out into the world and as babies anytime we're lying in the crib and we and we, we become terrified we cry to bring our caretaker back to our side because otherwise we feel that we are just, just going not going to survive um, and that original fear is in every so anyone going through any loss, including the loss of, a, of over death, um, has abandonment issues. It's the abandonment part, really, that makes it feel so painful. When you go through divorce, there are so many practicalities that are very painful, so much anger, unfairness, but the betrayal, the feelings of rejection, those are the feelings that trigger that abandonment part that make us feel so that extra tinge of pain so the um, anyone going through a loss can benefit from abandonment recovery wonderful and you also mention in the book that this is one of those books that you keep around so that if there is a situation that comes up then you have it on hand as a resource yes well you know it's got it's got easy to do exercises that kind of get you into a doing mode instead of just trying to think your way out of the problem it actually sends you on a bit of a journey a journey to the center of the self a journey out into the world it's a journey that that is easy to do because it you know it's step by step it's it's baby steps to to move in the right direction so it's sort of a a, a manual a resource guide to have on hand so that when you're feeling lost, you can just pick up the book and just start taking those steps in, in the direction of, of recovery. Beautiful. So it's not one of the, do you have to do it back to back or can you just open the book and find a resource or find an exercise at the time that feels in alignment? Well, you know, I wrote the book to be a resource that could be opened up at any place at any time and you can read it and, and find, you know, just an insight and have it take you from there. Um, that was the, the design of the book. However, it is a book that goes stage by stage through the five stages of abandonment and guide has exercises for each one of those stages that are specific to the different phases, stages that you go through when, when you're going through a loss or when you're trying to recover from a childhood loss. It takes you you know, sequentially through those stages. So I would say both um, back to back is a wonderful way to, to do it, the whole program sequentially. But it's also, it, it's each, each exercise is also um, independent and self-sustaining. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, you mentioned those five stages of abandonment and in the book you refer to them as SWIRL, S-W-I-R, L, maybe we can talk a little bit about what those are. Well, SWIRL is the acronym, and of course, that's exactly what the process feels like. When you're going through a loss, you swirl through it. It looks almost a tornado has taken you up. It has a mind of its own. It's a very 
powerful force. If you're, if any of your listeners are going through feeling rejected or abandoned by someone, you will know that it's just a powerful, powerful feeling that can absolutely bring you to your knees and you just go through all these stages, shattering, withdrawal, internalizing, rage and lifting. And I'll tell you quickly what they each represent. But you swirl through them and, and you're kind of thrown by these stages. Um, the shattering is when you first feel the insecurity. You realize your connection is threatened or maybe it's even destroyed. And it, it feels like the rug has been pulled out from underneath you and you're shattered. And then withdrawal is when you're yearning and aching for that love fix and you can't get it. And it's akin to heroin withdrawal where you're, where you're having flu-like symptoms. Um, you're having flu-like symptoms when you're in acute abandonment. You know, you, you feel sick, you can't sleep, you're, you're strung out. It's very similar symptoms. And then you're in the stage of internalizing where you're beating yourself up. You're taking the rejection that you feel, the anger, the rage that you feel about the rejection, and you're turning it against yourself. And you're saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not successful enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not charismatic enough. I'm not charming enough or whatever. You are beating yourself up and feeling less than and having self-doubt seep in. And then the next stage is rage, where you, and you're overlapping into these stages, of course. The next stage is rage, where you are not willing to take all of the blame, and your anger goes outward into the world. It's angry at the situation. It's frustrated that other people have a love life, or have a permanent job, or whatever it is, and you do don't it's angry your anger angry at your friends for not understanding what you're going through for saying things to you like just let go and move forward when in fact that is so difficult to do you feel all of this rage and you might even be in, in a rage toward your abandoner um, because that is the person or your boss who fired you because that is the person who triggered this powerful powerful reaction so rage is when you really begin to send the energy back out into the world. And when you have this rage, a lot of your, you know, the self-sabotage that's part of your, your repertoire of defense mechanisms that you've developed since childhood from your earlier, you know, abandonment situations, um, the, you, your outer child behaviors start to kick in and you will, some of your patterns, your self-defeating patterns start to come through. And you start to chase after the unavailable, or you start to avoid responsibilities, etc. All the different things we do to defeat ourselves. And then finally, we get to we swirl through overlapping. And then we have lifting, which is moments of interval of peacefulness. Or a friend tells a joke and we laugh and we realize, oh, I'm, I'm able to laugh again. Or a beautiful flower makes us suddenly realize how tender and its petals look and how lovely and we find ourselves being distracted by life because life is pulling us back out there but the key is in recovery when we go back out into life and during these intervals you know we'll go swirling back through the pain again but each time we we come to a moment of lifting we have to remember to take our feelings with us they're very precious and they're part of our recovery. If we squelch the feelings and try to ignore them or lift above the feelings and try to leave all of that abandonment pain behind, we can become very callous and numb. And the next time we seek love, we may have to seek someone who's verbally abusive or who's, who's unavailable or who, who simply is, isn't... Um, isn't capable of relationship in order to feel something because we are so numb we can't feel love as as easily as we could before now we can only feel insecurity and angst so we find that so that we can at least feel some it's a very common pattern um, so the five stages are what we work our way through you know as we go through the recovery process it's a step-by-step -step process 
Thank you so much, Susan, for that. When we were talking last time uh, in the interview about taming your outer child, we talked about the concept of being addicted to abandonment, abandoholism. And I'm wondering if, as you were talking about the, the lifting, is that the key to what makes us addicted to abandonment? Well, there are, there are many factors, and I don't want to, you know, make tie it up in a neat little package because it is, it's, it's a lot of different things. Um, another reason that we do it is because, you know, the person who abandoned us um, hurt us and caused pain, and the pain tricks our brain into thinking that that person is so special. They ha they must be very special and very powerful that they were able to cause so much pain just by being absent. So our brain is into having a very strong emotional reaction to that person. And we can come to confuse that with being madly in love with the person. When in fact, if we were completely objective and stood back from that whole emotional conditioning of the brain, we might look at that person and say, you know, they weren't so special. We're just an ordinary schmo that we met and got involved with. There was nothing all that special about them, really. Um, but we can't see that the brain is having this intense reaction such that, you know, for a lot of people, if you happen to accidentally bump into your ex, it can ruin your whole day. That is, unless you've already gotten over them and you're maybe into a new love, then it's okay. But if you're still, you know, struggling through and still trying to get over it and you bump into that person, it's like, oh, it's worse than as if you had seen a grizzly bear bearing down upon you. You feel such a strong emotional reaction. It will give you an emotional hangover, you know, and then you're working your way out of just seeing that person. That's how powerful they become to your emotional brain. So the brain gets conditioned to be in love with that which is unavailable. See, so that's another factor to that. There, there are many factors. It's a very interesting topic because it's so common. There are so many millions of people out there who are, you know, attracted to the unavailable. And they even know it, some of them, and they can't seem to break the pattern because when somebody comes along who is available, they just don't feel any chemistry. There's just no interest there. So it's such a common dilemma and a really interesting one. And people are very interested to know all the causes and what to do about it. Wow. So there's so, it sounds like there's just so many layers to the issue that it's hard to even know where to begin. I guess with the abandonment yes. recovery workbook is a good place to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your book also you mention, um, so we just went through the five stages of abandonment, swirl, but there's also um, almost personality types that are also related to swirl. Am I understanding that right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about well, you know, it, this, again, it, you know, these, uh, rather than tie it up, it, this makes it sound like these are neat little bow packages. But if you went through a lot of, um, you know, shattering experiences in childhood, let's say, um, you know, you, you, your mother actually abandoned you or your parents died or something of that sort, or you were sent to foster care, I'm using extreme examples, but you w went through a lot of shattering and you then internalized, you know, the shattering feelings. As an adult, you could have a psychiatric profile. Um, but then, then there are always resilient people in every family. And there are kids who grow up in these households who are strong, who have post-traumatic strength, post-traumatic growth. And so they don't succumb to having a psychiatric profile, but many do. Okay, so then... If, in, if instead of that you had a withdrawal style family where there was lots of need deprivation, the parents were there but they weren't available because maybe they were alcoholic. I've worked with so many abandonment survivors whose parents were, both parents were alcoholic and some whose parents were drug addicts, which means that the parents were physically there 
So your hopes and dreams were always being charged up that you're you're going to get the attention, that they will get a pumpkin this year, that they'll carve it and make it the most beautiful pumpkin on the block. But then it doesn't happen. They don't even buy a pumpkin. They, they're, too, they're too dysfunctional. The parents don't get around to it. And the child is, 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 the parents are there, but not emotionally there. So then you'll have this yearning, craving for something that's never quite there. And you're, as an adult, you can develop codependency patterns, addictive patterns. You can have a lot of emotional hunger and then outer child will feed that emotional hunger with shopping and alcohol and, you know, chasing the unavailable and taking naps instead of taking care of things and avoidance. And, you know, if you have a lot of emotional hunger, you're liable to eat, shop your way or drink your way into oblivion. And it's a very prevalent um, issue. Then if you come from a family where there was a lot of rejection and criticism, um, let's say the parents were hypercritical, one of the parents maybe had a narcissistic personality disorder and, you know, just made the child a scapegoat and the child had to make the parent happy instead of the other way around and it, it hurt the child's self-esteem growing up to be criticized, to be used, to be sort of invisible to be punished, um, then as an adult, you can have a low, pers a low self-esteem profile. And it means that you may have trouble reaching your goals. Um, it may mean that you have a low sense of entitlement. And the reason for this is because the outer child becomes very active. You know, the part of the personality that it wants immediate gratification will say, well, you're not good enough. You're not important enough to follow this long-term goal. So we'll just grab for the quick fix. So you'll go on a diet tomorrow, but instead of sticking to the diet, you're not important enough to, for us, me, me and my outer child, to stick to this. We're going to just do the easy thing and have a piece of cake when we want one and forget about the diet. Because when you have low self-esteem, it is very hard to feel good enough about yourself to delay gratification to achieve your goals. And then if you have a lot of rage in your childhood, maybe your parents were explosive, maybe they were rageaholic, or maybe they inflicted a lot of injustice and unfairness, or maybe you had siblings who bullied you and created rage in you. There, when there's a childhood where the child has to feel a lot of those angry feelings, um, a lot of the time, up into an in, into adulthood, having had quite a behavior profile during your adolescent time, uh, you know, your outer child became very active when you were a teenager, pumped with hormones, and you acted out and did drugs and all kinds of bad things that weren't good for you. And now, as an adult, you're kind of still paying the price, and you might also find yourself having conflict in your relationships because the anger is hard to regulate because of the amount of it that you have internalized from your childhood. Then if you came from a family where there was a lot of lifting, now this is an extreme example, but a lot of um, Holocaust families um, came back from such a horrendous, horrific experience and they had to lift above that in order just to survive. They had to put one foot in front of the other, and many n didn't talk about it, and just simply went on numb and, and trying to have a life, trying to feel again, trying to have a normal moment. And if you grew up in a household where the parents, for whatever reason, it could be cultural, it could be historical, it, but for whatever reason, the parents did not allow the expression of emotions and were themselves not very emotional, you can have, you know, a tendency not to have, feel, feel in touch with your own emotions. Maybe they shamed you about your emotions and, and said, you know, uh, big girls don't cry or something like this. And maybe, maybe you, you learned how to sort of be numb with your emotions. As an adult, you can have um, disintimacy problems. You can have trouble 
being feeling connected, creating deep connection, and getting vulnerable in a relationship because vulnerability is the name of the game to get into a good relationship. You have to get through that first year or two of real vulnerability when you start to really care about someone. And so people who have had that lifting background have a hard time, you know, accepting all of the the many emotions and knowing how to negotiate them. Wow. Susan, again, we're speaking with Susan Anderson. She is a psychotherapist, author of a number of books, but the one we're talking about today is the Abandonment Recovery Workbook, Guidance Through the Five Stages of Healing from Abandonment, Heartbreak, and Loss. And Susan, as you were talking about that instant gratification, it feels almost like that's that's our whole society right now. It's these personality types are very, very prevalent because we all share a lot of abandonment in our growing up. We can feel abandoned just from from very minor things. I mean, children are very sensitive to it. And so a lot of us do have these things. And probably one of the the two that I see most prevalent is the emotional hunger that gets satisfied with over shopping, over drinking, over sleeping, over, over, over everything, overdoing it. And the other one is, is the immediate gratification, which go hand in hand. The low self-esteem, which means that, you know, when I start to really love myself and I set a goal, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make, I, because I'm important enough. If it means setting my alarm for an earlier time, I'll set my alarm, and when it goes off, I won't hit the snooze button. I will get up, and I will do whatever my new goal is because I'm important, and what I want and my dreams and hopes are important. But when I have low self-esteem, well, I love myself, but not enough to do that for myself, you know, not enough to get up when the alarm goes off just to meditate for 15 minutes. No, um, not enough to forego the chocolate cake. Not if, not if it looks that delicious. No, I'm going to grab for the immediate gratification. It is so prevalent. Most of us, I would say, including myself, most of us succumb to immediate gratification in the, in the, um, uh, you know, in, in sabotaging one of our goals. You know, we, we, we're abandoning ourselves because we're abandoning our goals. Hmm. And I just want to get a little bit more clarification about these swirl types as well. You mentioned earlier on that it's not just in a in a nice little bow, because I was reading about all of the descriptions that you went through. And I think that I, I'm doing much better now with years and years of, of work on my abandonment issues. But I would say that easily I have three or four of those tendencies. Yes. Of the types. And I, yes, of the type. And I, I, too, have three or four of them of the type. But, you know, it's, it's very interesting. One of the enemies of abandonment recovery is um, perfectionism. Uh, perfectionism is one of the outer child traits. Not everybody has it, but those who do will think that they have to fix everything and they have to fix it perfectly. Let's say that your tendency is to be codependent. You know, you had you have sort of a withdrawal personality profile and you have emotional hunger and it makes you need love from people and be a people pleaser and need reassurance all the time and you you know you're always people pleasing okay that's it's it's you know you so you're a people pleaser let's say and you you don't want to be a people pleaser because sometimes you do it to your own expense and the other person even devalues you and you miss out you know, and, and you, you, you'd want to stop being a people pleaser. Well, if you're a perfectionist, you're going to think you have to give up being a people pleaser. But if you're really into abandonment recovery, you're looking only for an improvement. We're not trying to, to completely change ourselves from A to Z. We're not zebras who are trying to develop spots. We are loving ourselves and accepting ourselves, warts and all, and we are only trying to make enough of an improvement to make an improvement. It doesn't have to be perfect. So, uh, yes, um, I've been working on these things, of course, uh, along with you and 
all or many, many people. And I can say that I can still feel and see those traits in myself, but I love myself and accept that in myself. And I know that I'm, I'm always improving them a little bit, but I have improved them enough to get where I want to go. And when I find that I'm, my progress is slow, I know what to do. I know there are steps to take to, to fix it, to get back on track. Hmm. Well, Susan, again, with the perfectionism, I'm wondering if that's where that pendulum, they, you know, they say the pendulum swings in opposite directions. And I, and I think a lot of times when we're in the early stages of our recovery or self improvement journey, if we if we say let's let's say we're a people pleaser, then it might go okay. Well, I don't want to be a people pleaser, so I'm never going to do anything that I don't want to do, and then that negatively impacts our lives. How often do you see that? A lot, because sometimes people don't know how to modulate something; they only know how to use a shut off switch. So I've seen people go to the extreme of. Um, let's say they're in a friendship and they're giving more than they get. At least that's their perception. Um, it's it's a very common thing. Uh, many people will always give more than they get. It's their nature. Um, and so the, they gave their best friend a birthday card, a birthday gift, a call on her birthday, and all of that. Now it's their birthday and their friend has forgotten it. So they're a people pleaser and they did all of that for their friend because they want that love they want that friend to say oh she's where's my birthday but the friend doesn't turn around and give it back and this is very common it sounds cruel and horrible but it happens all the time it's just very common um so i've seen people go to the extreme of i refuse to be in this situation and they actually drop that friend they break up with the person you know they and that may be going to that extreme if they go from the extreme of being a people pleaser to that friend which the friend did not ask them to do to um ending the relationship altogether and what's going on there in an extreme like that where they can't find that middle ground is they're really saying my friend only will be friends with me for the things that i do for her or him they won't be friends with me if I don't do them favors, like remember their birthday or, you know, take, drive them to the, to the doctor. And, you know, if I don't do all these favors, that's the only thing about me that they love. And so that's why they're ending the relationship, because they really feel abandoned. And if they could modulate it, they would recognize that they have self-worth. See, this all gets back to the swirl, how we get stuck in the swirl. Uh, they, they would recognize they have self-worth and they're more than just their good deeds and the favors that they do, that they have value of themselves. And they would continue to lead with that and continue to be helpful in giving, but maybe just without expectations. So maybe they would still send a card on, on their friend's birthday, knowing they might not get one in return. But they won't send a card and a gift and make phone calls and surprises and all of that because they're setting themselves up because that friend may not have the capacity to reciprocate. So the middle ground has to do with accepting people for their limitations and accepting the part that you may have played being so eager to be a people pleaser that you have actually allowed the other person to take you for granted. And you just need a little change, not a drastic change, a little change that may subtly begin to make a difference. Hmm. Susan, I'm, I'm really glad that we came on this topic because I've been noticing, I think I've been on both the, the people pleasing and the receiving end of that people pleasing. And one of the things that I'm noticing more recently is that as an example, I, I recently went through a, a breakup experience. And in the past, when I've had any kind of loss, there have been people who would almost push support on me, they would come at me with this people pleasing friendship. And at 
in the past, I didn't have any other resources or supports. So I, I took on <clears throat> that friendship and then it would go to, okay, well, now you owe me. So yeah. now that I'm a little more balanced and I have coping skills and I have supports that are that are healthy in this most recent breakup, I noticed that energy coming at me. I noticed that people who were calling me and overextending themselves and I actually stepped back and kind of withdrew because I knew that that would come at a cost. I knew that it was probably not consciously a way to get their needs met but I knew that somewhere down the line there'd be you owe me this because I called you that yes. one time so I, I'm just kind of I'm not quite sure the question I'm asking on the one hand what does that say about me that I keep attracting those I this is a very judgmental term but I almost see it as an emotional vampire. Well, it's probably, I wouldn't say that it says too much about you, except that you're an attractive personality and that people want to uh, become friends with you. Probably, you know, that's what it's about, I would imagine. But the fact that these people have strings attached is human nature. So they... They they gave to you with strings attached, and you feel those strings, so it feels icky. Um, when when I'm the people pleaser, I have to be responsible for my actions and remind myself. You know, in my head, I have to do work to remind myself. Don't have strings attached. Just because you're able to give this, don't expect them to be able to give it back. And I'm usually successful in not resenting people and having expectations, but not always. Sometimes I'm very disappointed and hurt and so forth. Um, I went through, I've had a very diff different experience. I went through the death of my mate um, after, this was 10 years after my abandonment. My next mate, my next marital partner um, died. And he was a young man and it was tragic. And um I was so devastated, a different kind of grief from abandonment because there was no rejection involved. So the internalizing process of beating myself up was almost non-existent. So it was a much different kind of wounding process, a cleaner kind of cut. It was a cut, a deep cut, but it was cleaner. However, I was so lonely. I missed him so much. And I had been so good to so many of my friends in meeting needs and somehow was very angry and hurt and disappointed and all of that because I didn't feel when I was in my hour of need that I got it back. Then about, I don't know, five years later, uh, you know, sort of really looking back, I realized, of course, they, they did what they did a lot. But it wasn't enough because I was having unrealistic expectations of them because of my neediness. But I was so needy and, and in grief that I couldn't see it at the time. So I was actually expecting more than, than they were giving, you know. And I, it took years for me to look back on that and recognize it. But the more responsibility you can take for your own for your own behaviors and your expectations and the strings that you may have be have attached, um, the more, the better. So I, I think that's that is the the most important um, step in the recovery process is taking personal responsibility. Mm. Thank you so much, Susan. I, I'm so sorry um, for your loss. It just hurts my heart hearing that. And and also there have been times when I've been rejected and, and breakups and what you said about that that clean break the, that more clean loss I had that feeling of it would almost be easier if the person had died yes as tragic as that that is because that does take out the the rejection which is such a in addition to the pain and the withdrawal and the loneliness, that rejection is so cutting. 
Well, you know, it's sort of like um, picture Siamese twins being separated. With death, a scalpel was used. Anesthesia, to some extent, was used so that at least the beginning was was you're numb during the beginning part and it leaves you with a very deep cut that you have to you know a scar has to form but it was done somewhat surgically by life itself by the forces of life and death but with abandonment it feels as if your Siamese other half took out some sort of sledgehammer and chopped himself or herself away from the connection and left you in the recovery room with no anesthesia to bleed to death. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it feels like. It's the two different losses. They result in the same thing. You are still alone and have to survive the loss, which is a profound experience. However, with abandonment, you have a lot of damages. And the damages are in the form of shattering, withdrawal, internalizing, and rage. <laughs> Because they those those emotions are very powerful, and grief has a lot has damage also. But it's more the damage of, you know, you've learned a, a lesson in life that that we can't take anything for granted, that we don't have control over life, and that life is precious. So it's a hard lesson to learn, but we learn it. Um, so you could call that damages. But with abandonment, the damages can actually leave scarring that actually is has a negative impact on our future relationship and that's why it's so important to get into the recovery process and with death there are some abandonment feelings and those are the ones that really make the grief more complicated and and you know that really hurt and those are the ones that need the most attention during the grieving process those abandonment part those abandonment feelings, even though the person didn't choose to die in most cases, um, there still are some abandonment feelings, mm. unresolved conflicts that were in the relationship, etc. Well, and Susan, I can imagine with deaths that are related to suicide or perhaps drug addiction, where there is a, a, some level of choice. Well, the, the drug addiction is sort of accidental choice, mm -hmm. and suicide is seemingly more, you know, more intentional choice. Mm -hmm. um, and suicide, whether the person just couldn't help it, it's an illness of depression that just drove them to do it, or they heard command hallucinations telling them to do it or whatever. Um, but when the person commits suicide, it does, it, you do experience it as abandonment. The, the abandonment, that triggers powerful abandonment feelings and guilt. Then, you know, if I had been, had to add a stage in there, I would have shattering withdrawal, withdrawal internalizing guilt, <laughs> rage and lifting the guilt, the remorse. If only I had done this, if only I hadn't said that, if only, if only, if only. Um, the if onlys are there with any kind of loss, but it's especially um, prevalent in, in the case of an abandonment caused by suicide. Thank you, Susan. And we are speaking with Susan Anderson. She is a psychotherapist and the author of the Abandonment Recovery Workbook, Guidance Through the Five Stages of Healing from Abandonment, Heartbreak, and Loss. You can find her at her website, abandonment.net. And Susan, with regards to guilt and personal responsibility, I, I'd love to talk about that because I do feel I, I totally am in agreement about the personal responsibility aspect of recovery. And that's actually been a huge theme recently on synchronicity lately. But I think that just like the the people pleasing or the the pendulum swing sometimes when we start taking personal responsibility we take too much personal responsibility where's the balance yes well personal responsibility is an acceptance of ourself as having being flawed we are every single human being on the planet is flawed we are flawed creatures that's why we've had wars and holocausts and inquisitions and burning witches at the stake the human race is very complicated and we have 
you know, kinks in the machine. We've got worms in there and we're flawed. We're all flawed. We all have feet of clay. And we, it, it's a beautiful thing for a, a person to simply accept themselves as being imperfect and being able to own up to some of the issues that create liability for yourself or others in your life. And then accepting that removes the obsession of, oh, I should have done this. But uh, it removes the obsession it, once you really get grounded with it. But when you're feeling remorse because you, you, a relationship ended and you sabotaged it, you believe you sabotaged it, you may have. And you're beating yourself up, your insecurity sabotaged the relationship, you couldn't. You couldn't control your insecurity, your jealousy, or whatever. You know, you. I'm just imagining all the different things you became too, too demanding, too insecure. Your suction cups, your emotional suction cups, popped out and tried to, you know, devour the person, and it chased them away. And you're feeling so much remorse. Well, there is an obsessional process that you know. It's it's the brain does it automatically, and it's very hard to shut off the switch. But when you ground yourself in taking responsibility and simply accepting, yeah, I may have done some things that I couldn't seem to help. They were involuntary at the time. I was doing the best I could, and I'm only a human being, and this is what I did. So there it is. Just accept it, you know, that kind of attitude. Then you can really begin to shut down the obsession, and you can really begin to take some constructive inventory. You know, that's the whole thing about um, recovering from the outer child patterns, taming your outer child, begins with taking an inventory of yourself. But it doesn't mean you're, you're being critical of yourself and beating yourself up and, um, you know, over-imagining what a terrible person you are. Yes, I have insecurity that stems from a childhood wound. And it crops up when I least expect it to. And, of course, it's an unwanted intruder, but there it is. It's part of me. I have to learn to come to terms with it, and maybe I can heal it. So there, you know, so that it, it becomes a matter of really acceptance with a capital A, you know, the sublime acceptance, the kind of acceptance that we could call radical unconditional acceptance. You know, it's that's what it takes to, to stay centered problem. You still there, Susan? Yes, I am. Okay. We have been speaking about the abandonment recovery workbook with Susan Anderson. She is a psychotherapist. You can find her at abandonment.net. And Susan, we just have a few minutes left in the show. And we've been talking about so many topics related to abandonment, personal responsibility, radical acceptance, guilt, perfectionism, all of that. And and I'm wondering what you'd like to focus on for the last few minutes of this show. Well, the, um, the thing that I, I try to get across to people in, you know, in my outreach on my website and at my workshops and in all of my books is that there is hope. The, I don't expect people to accept that on faith because people who are experiencing abandonment, whether it's in a current crisis of a relationship issue or it's just the childhood issues make it hard for them to ever even get into a relationship or ever feel comfortable when they're finally in one. Um, it's hopeless. It feels like I, have, I can solve so many problems, but I can't solve that one. And the thing that I really try to get across to people is there is hope. Um, and, and don't take my word for it. Nobody can give you hope, especially the hopeless. Hate to be told, have hope, because they can't have hope. It's just impossible. So the only thing that they can do to have hope is to try something and see that it works. And unfortunately, since there are no magic bullets, no magic pills, you know, you can't just do, do three things and something works, and you immediately say, oh, this works. Um, there are none of those, unfortunately. I'm always looking for them. But there are step-by-step -step ways of incrementally strengthening a muscle in the mind that helps to really find happiness and make new connection, a muscle that overrides all the pain. 
Do you get rid of the abandonment wound? Do you resolve the abandonment fear? No, it's part of being human. You use it constructively so that it actually becomes something that you, you make peace with and it dissipates. The pain from it and the fear from it dissipates because you've actually come to accept that part of yourself and it doesn't, you can't make something that's so deep set from early, early childhood, you know, the birth trauma and the whole ordeal of being a, a dependent infant and having our caretaker come and go. Um, we, we can't make that go away, but we don't want to. It's part of what glues us one to another. It's what makes us adhere to our relationships because we, we do have a little fear of loss, so we don't just treat people lightly. We are good to the people in our lives. It, it's the basis of, of a lot of human community and human relationships and bonds. So we don't want to get rid of that. We want to learn how to deal with the feelings because the feelings can really guide us into a whole new happy life where there's love and connection and some of that love is actually, believe it or not, self-love. You know, it is learning how to love yourself. It's reversing self-abandonment and replacing it with self-acceptance, self-love, self-nurturing. So that is the message that I'm always trying to get across is that there is hope but I know you don't believe me but please do these steps and w do them diligently stick with it and see what I mean so that you can actually experience incremental improvement and like I said before the goal isn't to turn a zebra into a, a tiger we are who we are. We have basic, you know, traits in our personalities that we can, we can begin to change. We can begin to improve. We can make steps in the direction of becoming all that we want to become and reaching our potential. Of course we can do that. But we don't need to completely change, radicalize everything about us and have totally new patterns and get rid of all of the old patterns before we can have a very happy life. We need to improve a little bit certain things. We need to inch toward a better behavior or a better direction here and there, and that will make all the difference. When you look at the happy, fulfilled people, they're not perfect. They don't do everything perfectly, but they have enough. They've gotten themselves launched enough, and that's what we're looking to do. That is so beautiful, Susan. And I know from my own experience, even just the, the last time that we spoke when you were interviewing about taming your outer child, the difference between then and now in my life, not only in my relationships, but in my career and my friendships and just the way that I feel about myself is so, so much better. But at the same time, with all of this need for instant gratification because of low self esteem and, and needing to uh, sit with that vulnerability and, and attend to the discomfort. It's, it's not easy because you have to start somewhere you have to put that instant gratification aside and you have to face those yucky feelings. So I mean, the abandonment recovery workbook is is one tool you can use. You can go to uh, abandonment.net, Susan's website. But is there a first step that might make it a little bit easier? Well, you know how you opened um, our conversation with an intention, with a, with a meditation, um, and you brought us to the moment and there was consciousness and it increased. I went right along with you and, and closed my eyes and, and got into it and felt more conscious. When you are fully conscious and you are as are present to the moment as much as possible, you know how distracting life is. I mean, woo, it's just a <laughs> whirl of things distracting us. But when we can remain conscious, as conscious as possible, in real consciousness and we're succumbing to immediate gratification we will know what our goals are we will be in a greater position to choose the i said one enemy of abandonment recovery is perfectionism another 
is being sort of unconscious, going through the day, getting caught up, not thinking. So I recommend step one is having some sort of a daily regimen that brings you into consciousness, whether it's writing in a journal or meditating, doing yoga, taking a moment to jot down your goals and review them, admitting to the challenges ahead, you know, taking an inventory of your outer child that's liable to being aware that your outer child is trying to defeat you at all times. Outer child wants the second glass of wine, wants the piece of cake, wants the boat you can't afford. Outer child wants the nap, wants to avoid, wants to just have fun. So you're, if, when you're conscious, you're aware that you have these, you know, these contradictory forces that you're dealing with within you, and then you are much better equipped to handle it. Step one is consciousness. Mm. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. We are out of time, but we have been speaking with Susan Anderson. She is a psychotherapist, the author of her latest book, The Abandonment Recovery Workbook, Guidance Through the Five Stages of Healing from Abandonment, Heartbreak, and Loss. And this is the kind of book that you want to keep around and have it available as a tool. You can work through it no matter what's going through your life, but having it there as a resource when that abandonment is triggered or when that loss happens, because it, it happens for all of us. So I'm going to encourage everyone who was touched by this interview to take a look at it or go to her website, abandonment.net. And I I'm just so thankful for the work that you are doing in the world, Susan. And I know from all of the comments and questions from the, the last interview that have come up that you really are touching lives and that, as you said before, it, it may feel right now like there isn't hope, but we're going to hold space for you that there is. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to say before we close the show? No, I really appreciate, Marie, you're giving me the opportunity to just share this information that the book is available and that it's, it's you know, open to people and that it, it provides hope um, because you asked questions that led into lots of, lots of material. And, of course, there are hours and hours more discussion that we could have. It's just regretful that we close. <laughs> Thank you so much to Susan Anderson. Again, the name of the book is The Abandonment Recovery Workbook. And thank you so much for listening. I do encourage you, if you were at all moved or touched by this interview, to comment, to share this interview, to get in touch with myself or with Susan. And I just want to send you lots and lots of love and to let you know and remind you that you are loved. Namaste.